Hey everybody, Dr. Duncan here. This is a follow-up video lecture about the connections between climate change and biodiversity. There's a couple of important concepts I want to convey before we completely wrap up our exploration of climate change and biodiversity. The main message I want you to get from this is that we can respond to climate change in ways that use and promote biodiversity. And in addition to addressing climate change, this reduces the extinction crisis and enhances many of the ecological services that humanity depends on. To begin, let's make sure we have a clear understanding of these terms. Climate mitigation refers to efforts to reduce or prevent emissions of greenhouse gases. Climate mitigation is critical for reducing how severe climate change will be. Climate adaptation is the process by which we adjust to actual climate change that is already occurring or expected future climate change. Here's a clear connection between climate change mitigation and biodiversity, the tropical forests of the world. These forests are among the most important strongholds for remaining biodiversity on the planet. Unfortunately, we've been clearing them steadily for the last century. Tropical deforestation and land use change contribute about 10 to 20 percent of the global carbon emissions each year. Tropical forests contain about 25% of the world's carbon, so we cannot afford to have that carbon enter the atmosphere. Meanwhile, tropical forests help mitigate climate change by sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere through the process of photosynthesis. During the previous decade, tropical forests sucked enough CO2 out of the sky to match the equivalent of 6% of global anthropogenic emissions of greenhouse gases. That's a lot, considering what's at stake. Thus, protecting remaining tropical forests and restoring tropical forests where they've been cleared can reduce our net greenhouse gas emissions substantially, while also preserving much of the world's biodiversity. It's a win-win for people and biodiversity. Now, doing this isn't as simple as flipping a switch, unfortunately. We have to look at reasons why people clear tropical forests in the first place, a topic we don't have time for now. But ultimately, the solutions involve changing our food production systems and making our food production systems more efficient and altering our food consumption habits. I encourage you to look into these connections between food and tropical forests on your own. Okay, let's turn to another example of how maintaining biodiversity is important to our response to climate change. You know from the Simutex exercise that as climate warms, sea levels are going to rise. That rate of rising is accelerating. Global sea level has been rising over the past century and the rate has increased in recent decades. In 2014, global sea level was 2.6 inches above the 1993 average. That was the highest annual average in the satellite history. Sea level continues to rise at a rate of about one-eighth of an inch per year. That's an excerpt from an article by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Here's another quote that puts sea level rise in perspective. Between 1900 and the year 1990, sea level rose 1.1 millimeters to 1.7 millimeters per year on average. By the year 2000, that rate had increased to 3.2 millimeters per year, and the rate in 2016 was estimated to be about 3.4 millimeters per year. The point of this is that the rate of sea level rise is increasing. Now, this is a problem around the world for many reasons. Here in the U.S., a principal issue is that about 40 percent of the U.S. population lives along the coast. These curves on this graph show projections for sea level rise this century based on three of the representative concentration pathways. The topmost line is the business as usual model, also known as RCP 8.5, and it shows that between 2 to 4.3 feet of sea level rise can be expected this century. You can add to that another 2 to 4 feet if the rapid melting we're seeing in Greenland and in Antarctica continues. This is bad news for tens of millions of people in hundreds of coastal cities around the world. It's also bad for our coastal ecosystems. We're already seeing the, the die-off of those systems um, in the coastal forests on the east coast of the U.S. and on the Gulf Coast.
This is a picture from many of those so-called ghost forests along our coast, places where saltwater has intruded into coastal ecosystems, contaminating the groundwater and killing off forests. These forests are gradually becoming marshlands as sea levels continue to rise. This is all pretty grim stuff, but there are ways we can respond that protects biodiversity, promotes biodiversity, and safeguards what we humans need. As it turns out, we humans have been battling sea level rise for quite a while, and we have several strategies that work well. One is armoring, where we build structures that keep waves, tides, and storm surges from reaching the built environment. Other strategies include raising buildings out of the reach of most flood events. Many cities around the world, including several major cities in the U.S., are actively planning for how to protect their ci these cities as waters rise. These plans show how the waterfront in New York City might be transformed into a green space that can withstand floods like those seen when Hurricane Sandy struck in 2012. Notice the use of vegetation to hold sediment in place and provide aesthetic appeal. Good examples of ecosystem services. Okay, all of that which I've showed you are examples of what is called gray infrastructure. Examples for adapting to sea level rise include seawalls, rock walls, flood barriers, stormwater systems, groundwater pumps, levees, dams, raising land elevation. Due to reliance on concrete, rock, and metal, the nickname for these types of adaptations is gray infrastructure. It's the stuff you might already have been thinking about when we began discussing how we can respond to sea level rise. But there's another approach called green infrastructure. Green infrastructure uses natural and nature-based solutions to adapt to flooding and other problems created by environmental extremes. I want to share with you two examples being used on the Atlantic and Gulf Coasts. This is a picture of a salt marsh. It's a brackish water wetland dominated by non-woody vegetation, mainly grasses. Despite their modest look, salt marshes are the most productive ecosystems on the planet, conducting more photosynthesis than even a tropical rainforest. They are incredibly important for coastal ecosystems because many species use them as nursery grounds for their juveniles. This includes many of the valuable seafood species pictured here. Another ecosystem of these coastal areas is the oyster reef. Oysters are commercially valuable, and like the marshes, they serve as nursery grounds for many species, including commercially important ones. As it turns out, both marshes and oyster reefs can help us adapt to sea level rise by preventing flooding during storms and reducing shoreline erosion. Nearshore reefs serve as breakwaters, which reduce erosion of marshes and beaches. When storm surges from hurricanes or other flood events roll ashore, salt marshes absorb that flood water and slow it down, allowing time for the storm to pass and waters to decline. The net result is less flooding of nearby natural and human habitats. It's been estimated that marshes greatly reduce the economic damage of hurricanes along our coasts. Salt marshes and oyster reefs are examples of green infrastructure, where nature can be used to help us adjust to climate change, and flooding in particular. The beauty of this approach is that green infrastructure also provides other valuable ecosystem services, including the filtering and cleaning of water, of sediments, toxins, and excess nutrients. They serve as nursery grounds for commercially important seafood species. They promote tourism, and they trap carbon dioxide, which helps with reducing the extent of climate change. These ecosystems can also grow in elevation to keep up with sea level rise, something that a, a concrete wall cannot do. Another thing they can do that, wall, that concrete walls and other gray infrastructure cannot is that they can self-heal after some damage. That means that they can essentially grow back in places where they're, they're, where they're damaged without any humans having to be involved. And as if, as if this were not convincing enough, consider this. A 2018 study by Borja Ruggiero and colleagues examined the economic benefits of natural shorelines as adaptation strategies to reduce flooding risk and damage on the Gulf Coast. If sea level continues to rise at the present rate, by the year 2030, the U.S. Gulf Coast will sustain a minimum of $134 billion in damages from coastal flooding each year. 
That's more than the combined economic damage from Hurricanes Florence, Michael, and Irma combined. Green infrastructure such as marshes, oyster reefs, but also beaches and barrier islands can prevent 37% of these damages, saving $50 billion annually. For this reason, salt marshes, oyster reefs, and even barrier islands are being restored in the eastern U.S. This picture is of a project in New England that was part of the response to Hurricane Sandy. Here we see volunteers helping to establish a nearshore oyster reef. You see sacks of shells from a nearby seafood processing factory being set out to form a reef base onto which new oysters and other animals will start to grow. The round structures in the water are reef balls, concrete structures designed to provide habitat for marine species in a way to further minimize wave action on the shore. You can see the older balls on the right have already become encrusted with oysters. Over time, oysters will grow on these structures and form a reef that will help protect the coast against sea level rise. And here we see a large marsh and reef restoration project at Bayou La Battery on the Alabama coast. Ultimately, this project will protect local fishing town, a local fishing town, while also restoring marsh and reef habitat, which sustains coastal biodiversity. Green infrastructure won't work everywhere, but a combination of green and innovative gray infrastructure is what we need now and along our coasts. Okay, one more example of using green infrastructure, and this time right here in Birmingham. Climate change is creating two major problems for urban environments. First is the urban heat island effect. You may have noticed that the more urbanized a landscape is, the hotter it gets on a summer day. That's because the materials that we build with absorb a lot of heat and re-radiate it as long-form radiation. In contrast, areas that are vegetated stay a lot cooler. That's because as plants conduct photosynthesis, they emit water vapor into the atmosphere. As that water goes from the liquid to the gas state, energy is added to it. This takes heat from the landscape and dissipates it into the surrounding atmosphere. Essentially, plants are functioning like little air conditioning units. Another way that plants cool the surface of the earth is by shading. You can feel that on a hot summer day when walking on a street that's covered by trees than walking on one that's not. All that heat concentrating in the urban environment causes problems. Some materials can warp in the extreme heat that climate change is bringing. And the increased heat means that we have higher cooling costs due to running our air conditionings. But the most alarming problem of the urban heat island effect is that it increases the number of hours that people are exposed to dangerously high temperatures. High temperature exposure is related to a variety of acute health threats, including heat stroke and heart attacks and asthma attacks. This tends to strike lower socio socioeconomic groups more than others because they often live in those neighborhoods that are the most prone to heating. What's more, they live in environments where houses and buildings are older and poorly insulated. And these are the populations that are least able to afford rising electric bills due to using more air conditioning, that is, if they even have air conditioning. Finally, lower socioeconomic groups are more likely than others to suffer from pre-existing conditions that make them more vulnerable to heat-related illnesses. It's a perfect storm. A related problem is urban flooding. Climate change has already caused storms to be stronger and deliver more rain a trend that's expected to increase in the future. Because urban environments are paved over, there's no place for rainwater to seep into the soil like it does in a forest. Cities have dealt with this by creating stormwater systems, which are underground pipe networks that collect water from streets and parking lots and funnel it into nearby streams and rivers. The problem is that with storms being stronger now, we're getting more urban stormwater than ever before. This is causing massive erosion in nearby creeks and rivers, which threatens local aquatic biodiversity, and it's causing more flooding in our urban areas as storm waters back up in some neighborhoods. These floods are more than just a nuisance. They can cause considerable economic damage and even cause injury and drownings. Fortunately, we have several solutions to both the urban heat island effect and urban flooding, and one of them is green infrastructure. This include green roofs like this one that you see on Children's Hospital in Birmingham. It includes bioswales like this one at an apartment complex in Birmingham. 
This is where water from parking lots flows into an engineered garden that allows water to seep into the ground instead of a stormwater system. It includes planting trees in urban areas to shade and cool down sidewalks and parking lots and absorb rainwater. It includes creating more urban parks like Railroad Park in Birmingham, which converted several blocks of industrial wasteland into a beautiful park that attracts thousands of people each week. The ponds you see here capture the rainwater so there's no contribution to flooding. Green infrastructure solutions in the urban environment also includes creating smaller pocket parks like the ones set up by Birmingham Southern's very own Roald Hazelhoff, who works at the Southern Environmental Center. So all of this is to give you some examples of the ways we can both mitigate and adapt to climate change, while at the same time providing more habitat for biodiversity. This also enables us to enjoy a range of ecological services which protect us and enhance our ability to prosper. I thought this would be a nice way to end our exploration of biodiversity and climate change because it focuses on solutions that are good for us and good for biodiversity. Tacked on to the end of this PowerPoint file are links to a few videos you can watch if you want. They're entirely optional. Just download the PowerPoint and click on the images on the slide to link you to the video. The videos include this one on the ghost forest created as sea level rises, this one on how San Francisco is having to figure out how to adjust to sea level rise. This video is about how New York City is planning on adjusting to sea level rise. This video introduces how some communities in the US and around the world are having to move as a result of sea level rise. This one is about how green infrastructure is being used to protect coastal communities in other parts of the world. And this one, which shows examples of using marshes and reefs along the northern Gulf Coast to protect coastal communities.